to the mock interview uh, briefly introduce yourself about yourself your education background what you have been doing and briefly about your hobbies and anything which you wish to mention very briefly um, i'm from ilahabad uttar pradesh i did my graduation in electrical engineering from iit delhi then after i worked in air force authority of india uh, for two years as an electrical engineer currently i am in the indian information service uh, of the 2020 batch and that's what okay you are uh, in which service indian information service okay you are already selected okay last year yes sir. okay so abhishek uh, can you tell me about the scope and challenges of electrical vehicles in india sir uh, the scope of electrical vehicles is huge currently we have uh, the penetration of electrical vehicles in the market is very little the government has targeted to shift to 30% electrical vehicles by 2030 initially the target was around 100% so the scope is huge and it is only going to increase as uh, the income levels increase and more and more people switch to vehicles um, coming to the challenges sir, the biggest challenge at present is the cost uh, then the charging infrastructure is a challenge then awareness about electric vehicles is a challenge uh, the fact that uh, electric batteries have not yet broken the 100 dollar per kilowatt hour mark it is also a challenge uh, which keeps the costs higher um, then we do not have sufficient manufacturing capacity in india as present so that is also a challenge several uh, factories have come up and they are uh, they will be starting production or uh, they are at various stages of production so once that happens i'm sure we will be able to ramp up the capacity okay abhishek in your introduction you told that uh, you hail from allahabad basically which is now actually prayagraj Yes, sir. Okay. So, can you tell me the reason behind naming of the cities, uh, especially since last decade? What is the logic behind it, and whether uh, should we keep on continuing this trend or not? Sir, um, Ilhabad uh, was a very ancient city um, in the Indian in the Indian I mean in our nation. In Hindu civilization, in Hindu uh, ancient scriptures, Ilhabad is mentioned as Prayagraj. So, as a DM of your, as a DM of your district, so how would you remove this vaccine hesitancy among people? Sir, there could be uh, two broad sets of measures. One would be persuasive measures, and the other would be coercive measures. So, some coercive measures that were recently taken, for instance, by the DM of Rozabad, um, uh, that. Those government servants who do not uh, get themselves vaccinated would be um, levied some penalty or some fine. Then, um, but these uh, coercive measures may not yield much in the long run. What we want is for people to themselves want to go and get vaccinated. For that, what we can do is uh, we 
can have a better communication strategy wherein we can communicate the benefits of vaccination then uh, we can uh, televise or in some other ways uh, propagate um, vaccination of some uh, prominent local leaders be it political leaders be it religious leaders or be it uh, leaders from uh, movies or sports or otherwise so uh, that would instill confidence then we could bring out advisories or we could bring out information which shows um, the case studies from other successful states that have gotten vaccinated or other successful countries for instance us uk israel which are now opening up uh, because they have got themselves vaccinated and once all this information goes out to the people i am sure uh, that significant uh, reduction in vaccine efficacy can be observed okay abhishek uh, can you briefly do swot analysis of indian economy sir uh, for the indian economy the strength uh, one strength would be its demographic and demographic dividend we are the youngest among the youngest nations in the world the second uh, strength would be its climate in the country the reforms that have been brought in the economic reforms and that they, 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 they have been continually brought, continuously being brought in uh, another strength would be its uh, significant uh, human capital the education levels of some of our top institutes are top notch in the world so that would be a strength weaknesses are again um, demographic dividend can become a de a demographic curves if the health and the skill levels of the population are not enhanced significantly uh, we see that vocational training is not provided to enough individuals so that would be a weakness then sir another weakness would be um, our banks our financial institutions the npas that are there and the asset liability mismatch that happens with npfcs so uh, that hampers credit growth uh, and that in turn hampers economic growth coming to opportunity sir one big opportunity that india has is uh, that its competitors like china um, are are becoming uh, slowly and slowly they are becoming that of a high wage uh, economy and once they go away the gap that arises can be filled in by india another opportunity that comes in is that uh, significant synergies are being created between india and western economies particularly india and us and once uh, technology transfer or uh, uh, skill transfer happens uh, we can in scale up very fast then sir threats would be the biggest threat that india face faces would be the middle income trap that countries like south africa and brazil find themselves in wherein they cannot increase beyond a certain point uh, the reason is that they cannot compete with the western economies or the advanced developed economies in terms of their skills or knowledge or technology level but they also cannot compete with the low income countries because the wages in their countries are high enough so that's the biggest threat faces this would be a small short analysis of india yeah Fair enough. Uh, how long it has been when you joined Information Services? Uh, sir, I joined uh, two months back. Okay, so you are in probation. Yes. Okay. okay. So I see this interesting uh, hobby of yours. Uh, what is this uh, recreational computer programming? Sir, I pick up uh, questions that are of. Uh, curiosity or scientific interest and i model programs on them so for instance a simple program could be uh, that you model the path of uh, a satellite from earth to moon and you can do that using simple gravity equations and you know, that looks very beautiful once it's completed once the model gets completed or a, a simple thing would be you heat the rod at one end and you see how the temperature changes over so these are simple computer programs that can be done and uh, okay so we see many uh, computer games also these days and uh, it has been alleged that uh, we are actually promoting gambling for example dream 11 in fact uh, online ludo game bombay high court considered whether ludo is a game of skill or or it is a game of gambling what is your take on that sir uh, justice ludo committee had recommended and that betting uh, be uh, betting not be prohibited and that betting in fact be regulated because once we start prohibiting betting or gambling what it does is it actually pushes it underground instead of uh, curtailing it so what happens is once it goes underground there are no regulations and that hurts uh, those the gamblers or the bettors even more uh, coming to the fact whether it is a game of skill or a game of chance the supreme court has said that uh, several of these games including poker or uh, and dream 11 fantasy sports there actually some amount of skill is involved in that so we cannot say that they are they are pure games of chance and we can also cannot say that they are pure games of skill because uh, 
there is an element of luck involved with that. So, sir, we cannot go either way with these games. So, I pass on to you, sir. So, Abhishek, uh, I have seen in your dash that you have worked in Airport Authority of India. Yes, sir. You are still working? No, sir. I have. I am currently in the Indian Information Service. Okay, you joined. Have you are on? Leave. Sorry, sir. You have joined IIS and you are on leave. Yes, I am not on leave, sir. I am currently undergoing training. Acha. Okay. So tell me, uh, with your background in the Airport Authority of India, uh, what has been what has been the reason for rapid privatization of airports in India? Even in the two second tier towns, I mean, is it because the Airport Authority of India is no longer uh, efficient enough to deal with, uh, you know, more and more uh, uh, traveling people and the and the uh, and the pressure, or maybe some other reason? Can you provide some reasons? Uh, so one, as you rightly pointed out, the Airports Authority of India is short on funds, and whatever funds it has, the government wants it to utilize that to develop a smaller airport in a smaller places instead of catering to cities like Delhi or Mumbai, which, or other larger cities like Lucknow, which have uh, been commercialized to a certain extent and profit can be extracted from there. So funds is definitely a major factor. Then also comes expertise. Aviation sector is uh, runs on wafer thin margins, and it has a very it requires very high expertise. This, this expertise can come easily from the private sector. So that's also one thing that we are looking at. Then the next thing that we are looking at, so since uh, for, the, for some of these larger airports, uh, they have already become profitable. And profit-making enterprise uh, is better run by the private sector than by the government sector. The government sector will do well in places like, say, Pathankur, where uh, you do not have sufficient traffic, but you still need that in order to uh, work for any other smaller airport where you need um, such infrastructure. So there, the, uh, the government has shifted its priorities there. So these are some of the major reasons then, sir. Also, the bids that have come up, you know, for instance, uh, for some of the recent airports that were privatized, it, a calculation was done. And for the, those six airports, the uh, Airport Authority of India was able to extract 500 crores revenue um, out of those airports. But uh, the bids that were received were that of 1,000 crores. So instant doubling of revenue and without putting in any funds. So this model was thought to be best suited for airport development in the country by the government, the civil aviation ministry. Okay, but tell me, uh, the private sector, the experience of GMR and GVK, we've had experience of these two privatizations, dial, mile, for last almost a decade, but they are also in the red, and they keep complaining uh, about, you know, the airport stresses imposed by AAAI and uh, charges. They are still not, not viable. So, how do you think that with less uh, passenger load, the town's privatization will be a success? Uh, sir, uh, if we look at the balance sheet of uh, Airports Authority, we will find that Delhi and Mumbai are one of the biggest contributors of profit. So, uh, we get a lot of revenue out of that. And that one of the major reasons for that is the fact that they have been privatized and the private entity. Entities, GMR and GBK, have sought to maximize their revenues from there. Uh, what they claim that they are in red is not entirely true. Uh, what, what they do want from AI is that AI reduce its services, but that is a different debate altogether. Uh, coming to the point of whether a smaller airport, say like Lucknow or Ahmedabad, can they be privatized? Uh, whether they are profitable or not. Sir, they have just turned profitable. In fact, till now, the government. Uh, the government's policy was that it will only privatize profitable airports. Now, the government has sought uh, to make a small shift in its policy. It will tie one profitable airport with one unprofitable or less profitable or maybe loss-making airport so that the private entity can uh, develop both and make both of them profitable. So this is what the policy of the government is. Whether it will be successful, sir, uh, Delhi and Mumbai have given more than 30,000 crores worth of profit to Airport Authority of India since 2006, since they were privatized. And we hope that success will be replicated in the other airports. Now, you are an electrical engineer, Abhishek. Yes, sir. So tell me, in the latest electricity policy of the country, 
in what manner is going to address uh, the goal of climate climate change and reducing the carbon footprint sorry sir your voice is breaking i do not hear you i said the the electricity policy of the country yes sir in what in what manner is it addressing the goals for climate change and number 2 to reduce the carbon footprint sir uh, the electricity policy of the country uh, uh, focuses on renewable integration with the grid that is uh, done through renewable purchase obligation renewable genera generation obligations where the major generators and the major consumers have to uh, uh, use some part of it from renewable sources then uh, there are energy exchanges uh, where electricity can be exchanged uh, electricity exchanges i mean and there uh, recent policy shifts have been towards green for the green term ahead markets or uh, green energy being uh, transferred through that so that is also an area then for reducing the for reducing the carbon footprint uh, the electricity policy also talks about increasing energy efficiency of uh, the uh, electrical pro um, products that we use then sir uh, we are also talking about smart meters once the smart meters come up we will we will be able to have time of day tariffs we will be able to use uh, products um, energy consuming products when the tariff is the lowest so that will net result will be that energy consumer and energy consumed will be lower and uh, consequently uh, the carbon footprint will also reduce then apart from that open access is focused upon uh, with open access uh, there will be sufficient competition in the electricity distribution and uh, in, the, in the electricity generation segment and that will help uh, the renewable energy producers to come up so these are some of the ways the electricity policy uh, helps to achieve the goals of uh, climate resilience okay abhishek you are in india information service now yes. tell me uh, among among all the modes of communication of media uh, electronic including radio tv and many more social media digital now today for india as a whole can you rate as to which is the most effective uh, media to disseminate you know the information related to public service so uh, when we talk about effectiveness we will have to define the target audience um, for instance if we are looking at say a rural population elderly population then something like twitter or uh, other digital means of communication would not work there say newspaper might work better or say radio might work better then if we come to say the journalistic segment if we want to interact with media and if we want to interact with that in real time in that case uh, social media or digital media would be the fastest mode of communication if we um, so, so effectiveness again would depend on our target audience the message that we want to send and uh, how fast we want the communication to be so um, we can rate based on that so, so tell me uh, coming within the within in the sphere of your present job india has another problem of fake news and lately of fake news now generally it is felt that you know that the ministry of information and broadcasting may not have enough powers to control or to you know set the paid news means i would say uh, set it right now what do you think uh, uh, should be done to cut paid news sir uh, for the print media we have press council of india uh, which has often been said for which it has often been said that it does not have enough powers to enforce its decisions for the television um, the news channels uh, what we find is that they have a self regulatory body news broadcasting standards authority where we have seen that sometimes uh, its decisions have not been enforced or its decisions have not been implemented then for social media or the digital uh, media we do not have an effective enforcement or regulatory uh, machinery as of now so what can be done is 
we can have the best of all the worlds of uh, press council of india we can have uh, the best of new broadcasting standards of party and other self regulatory mechanisms uh, what can be done is we can create a body wherein government has a say wherein the private sector also has a say and wherein say independent third party uh, uh, independent third parties are also involved particularly the judiciary needs to be involved so that uh, the rights to uh, right to freedom of speech and expression as well as um, the violating uh, rights of uh, i mean the violations can be curbed so sir, this is by creating one such body which can probably integrate print uh, digital as well as electronic uh, that needs to be created with uh, stakeholder participation from the government from the industry and from the judiciary okay so uh, abhishek i pass on to uh, mr i pass on to mr karna so what is so, it that uh, you civil service and why you are so determined to join civil services sir you, i'm sorry sir your voice is breaking i could not hear Have the last part uh, uh, my question is why do you why do you want to join civil services sir um, the major attraction of civil services for me is the fact that uh, it gives me a chance to give back to the society to do social service then it also has a very wide diversity of roles it has a uh, good growth and uh, i the subject matter that is policy formulation and policy implementation i i am fascinated by that so these are some of the reasons why i want to join the civil services okay since you are an information service i i am tempted to ask you this question role of private media and journalism standard of journalism today what do you feel about it do you think that role of private privately owned media to a great extent has uh, compromised the ethical journalism sir um, on the one hand uh, yes there are instances of fake news as uh, you know sir rightly pointed out then there are also instances of fake news there are instances of sensationalization of each and every bit of news uh, then some important news is not picked up many times because it does not serve the purposes of prp so yes it does seem that uh, the corporatization of media houses the privatization of media houses has sought to make it a profitable venture which was not earlier uh, so in that sense we might say that uh, the role of media has been dented to some extent but then sir uh, we must also remember that media is the strongest bulwark against um, against a despotic government it is what keeps the government in check uh, it acts as the fourth pillar of democracy after legislative executive and judiciary so it has a very important role to play and uh, while there have been instances where the media has not Uh, served its role to the fullest purpose. There have also been instances where they have um, actually helped in the cause of Indian democracy. Uh, be it any major uh, corruption scam in the past, or even uh, ABC for COVID, uh, a lot of pressure was built on the government because the media focused on the vaccination strategy that was being followed in India. Because the media brought out the loopholes, what was being done on the ground, and it was uh, partly because of that that sustained pressure was being maintained on the government. Okay, okay, and then there are uh, parallel issues on media trials. What you have to say on that? Privately owned media conducts its own trial and uh, try to uh, prejudice the judgment in an advance. Yes, sir. Um, that is definitely an issue. In fact, media trial has been debated not just in India but in every um, major country across the world. Uh, the right to freedom of speech and expression, Article 19, does say that the media houses do have a right to do that. But then, every person also has the right to a dignified life and liberty under Article 21, uh, which would ensure that he or she should get access to fair trial. and by trial so sir there indeed these are competing uh, competing rights and it is very difficult for us to put a blanket ban on media trials which cannot be done also we cannot let media trials go unhindered that cannot not be done uh, the best way 
way to solve this problem would be to ensure that a set of good a code of good practices is brought out which is followed uh, by the media houses voluntarily and in a self regulatory manner and what about a regulator what about a regulator sir uh, even if a regulator is brought in in order to maintain the independence of media uh, we might have to see that uh, it is housed by someone say from a, a retired member of judiciary it has sufficient representation of industrial uh, in person the street itself and it has minimum interference as uh, the government okay. has rightly pointed okay. out that the government will regulate with a light touch okay, uh, okay. you have heard of what sorry sir you have heard of quad 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 -A yes sir ad yes sir do you think india's yeah. participation in quad means that india is entering into the era of alignment at one time we were votary for non aligned movement and uh, do you think there has been a drastic change in our foreign policy because of what so uh, even when uh, mr jawaharlal nehru brought out the policy of non alignment it categorically stated it doesn't mean that india will uh, never seek partnership uh, with anyone in fact even at the height of cold war when india was strictly with the cause of non alignment india had partnered with both ussr as well as usa on several occasions even today india says uh, that it maintains strategic autonomy and it can have relations with whoever and uh, it wants without forming any alliance uh, any hard alliance and this is uh, what uh, the court is expected to be while china does claim that it is it is intended to be against china and it is going to build two poles in the world india has pointed out that court is not against china court is a general measure where like minded countries democracies okay okay fine together. let's let's uh, move on to uh, uh, district where you will be posted it is a question hypothetical in nature flooding in your district in a particular season what steps would you take as dm of your district to protect lives and property so uh, there would be pre disaster steps there would be post disaster steps pre disaster steps would be early warning systems would be brought in the reverse uh, uh, for the reverse we can have sensors that detect um, the level of water in the rivers then for monsoons we can have uh, uh, detection we can have advisories from uh, imd uh, we uh, for pre disaster steps we also need to make sure that the flood plain the flood plain zoning is done and vulnerable areas are exempted from human habitation um, similarly we can also have post disaster steps when flooding happens what we can do is we can quickly shift the families particularly the vulnerable the poor families to safer areas we can make sure that basic infrastructure that of um, telecommunication that of uh, roads that of um, other means of transport is brought online as soon as possible then uh, one thing that often happens is flooding is that health takes a toll water borne diseases spread very fast so for that we have to make sure that the diseases that is spread through water are checked and uh, the health infrastructure is strengthened considered so these are some of the steps that can be taken so providing food shelter for those who are moved to safer places yes that should, that should also be a priority okay last, last question uh, uh, before i pass on to chairman it is said that india has all the natural resources for our needs do you agree with this statement so so why if not so uh, india india does have if we talk about energy per se which is the basic building block uh, to all other endeavor uh, 
we'll find that India does have sufficient coal reserves. We have 300 billion tons of coal. Then we might not have enough petroleum as yet. So for that, we are dependent on other countries, on petroleum exporting countries. But if, if that can be done away with, if we shift to say more of nuclear, India has some of the biggest petroleum reserves in the world in the monolites and for Kerala. If we shift to gas-based economy where India can meet more of its needs, um, then if we shift to other forms of energy, like say um, India also has some of the world's largest reserves of methane gas hydrates in the Bay of Bengal basin. So for energy sector, if we shift to, if we make certain changes and if we shift from petroleum uh, guzzling industries and transports, then we could say that to some extent India is uh, self-sufficient in that. Then comes the part of say human capital. Um, in some of the more knowledge intensive sectors, India does not as yet have the technology where it is reliant on technology transfers from West, uh, which is uh, evident in the case of uh, even nuclear plants or in um, space. Uh, we are planning to send Gaganyan, but we have to rely on uh, help from Russia or from France. So even there, uh, we might need some human resource help. Similarly, in the field of industry, while we have uh, advanced a lot industrially, there are still areas where we are not self-dependent and self-reliant. And in the, in, it is in order to fill these gaps that the concept of Arthur Bharat was brought forth by our honorable team. Okay, okay, fine. This question was only limited to natural resources, not to all possible resources, okay? Okay. Uh, Vinodji, over to you. Okay. So, uh, Abhishek, it has been it has been seen that the vaccination <coughs> drive, uh, which has this, uh, which has happened in the country over the last last three four months, the there has been a skewed distribution. Like women uh, have got much lesser vaccination than the males. Now. What could be the reasons uh, for the skewed ratio, uh, number one? And suppose if you were uh, the district collector of uh, Allahabad someday, how would you reduce this gap? What special measures would you like to take to accelerate the vaccination of women in your district? So uh, one reason could be uh, for the skewed vaccination uh, gender, uh, gender basis of the uh, skewedness could be that uh, patriarchy is deeply ingrained in the society. So for instance, women do not often leave the house much. And since they do not leave the house much, they uh, do not go to the vaccination. Or if they do not, if they do not leave the house much, they do not feel the need to go back, uh, to go the, to get themselves vaccinated because it is often the men that go out in the open. Uh, this could be a reason. Then apart from that. Vaccination itself has been scarce and uh, um, sufficient supply has not been available. And whatever supply has been available has been uh, gotten by those who are actually going out. Uh, frontline workers, health, uh, healthcare workers, these are the ones who have gotten themselves vaccinated. And uh, we know that the labor force participation rate ratio of women is very poor compared to that of men. It is only 18%, while for men it is 70 to 80%. Since it is these that were vaccinated first, uh, these, uh, it could be the reason that women are less vaccinated as compared to men. Uh, coming to the part of how to solve this problem, sir, one thing that could be done is, and in fact it has already been done is, if instead of vaccinating only the healthcare workers and the frontline workers, where we will be lower in number, we can vaccinate the entire population, and it is being done currently. Then uh, we can also have separate vaccination places for women, where only women go, so that women feel safer. And uh, then we can have, say, all uh, female doctors, female nurses. So in that way, also women will feel safer. Then word of mouth will play a big role. Communication strategy should be such that are more directed towards women. Say, if we use the office networks to communicate regarding vaccination, then it is, then it is often the men who will get that. But if we use, say, television as a medium, which women will watch at home, so that could be another step that can be taken. And then women role models will have to come forward once the whole model effect kicks in, then more and more women will get themselves vaccinated also. Then we'll also have to point out, we'll also have to tell the women uh, and in fact the entire society that even if one member of the family is not vaccinated, it could affect the entire family. So then um, we can have more and more mothers and more and more women getting themselves vaccinated in order to support the family and support themselves also. These are the 
these are some of the steps that can be taken. So, Abhishek, uh, we have we have finished all round of questions from our side. Now, if you have missed out any subject or topic, and you would want us to ask from that missed out subject, please let us know. I'll ask the question from the subject of your choice. Sir, uh, my father is in railways. So I have been asked questions uh, on railways in, in my previous interviews. That people ask me questions. So, so the aim of green railways. What what exactly is this uh, green railways, and what is the timeline, and what are the ingredients of turning railway green? Sir, so, uh, one could be rapid electrification of tracks of railways. Um, currently, only about 50% of the tracks have been electrified. So that once that phase picks up, and uh, it is being prioritized by the government also. And then, sir, the electricity that the railways will run on, even that should not be procured from thermal sources. That should be procured from renewable sources. In fact, for that, um, the railways has started procuring power directly from renewable energy producers. Also, the railways has started using its own land for setting up solar plants. And uh, from these solar plants, it will take uh, green, um, uh, it will take green electricity, and it will use that to power its railways. Then, apart from that, services on the rails that are provided. For instance, we can have uh, biodegradable toilets, which are uh, which have already been done in several places in southern India, and it is being replicated in northern India. So, once that happens, uh, overall environment will reduce. These are some of the steps that can be taken. It has, it has, and these steps have also been highlighted in the National Rail Plan of 2020. So, Abhishek, we have finished our uh, formal interview. Now, Abhishek, you, you, you are very good. I mean, your performance has been uh, extremely good. Uh, you are right. You are very well informed, very knowledgeable. Your span of knowledge is good. Your length and breadth of knowledge is good. Uh, you go into the depth also of the subjects. And you could cover and field all the questions very deftly uh, with content. Uh, for example, you know, you answer this privatization question very well. And you balanced it out when I asked you some some more supplementary questions uh, on the electricity policy. Also, I am very happy that you were aware of most of the electricity policy guidelines. Uh, I also asked you about uh, the paid news, and you were able to uh, give a very balanced view. So, so overall, your content was very good. Uh, you were fluent. You were comfortable, you were confident in speaking, your English was good. Two things which I would like to point out. Two things I would like to point out. Yes, sir. One is that you speak a bit faster. Okay. So so most of the time, you know, it is the same same pitch, same no modulation. No pauses, no commas, and you know it seems as if you know you are reading it out and reading out very fast. Now, one thing is that you know so much about the question in the, the answer that you want to pour everything as early as possible immediately. This is this is my feeling. The other could be that you have a habit of speaking very fast. So actually, I have a habit of speaking fast. Haan. So, usme kya nuksan ho raha hai? Or dusra main point aur bata do, and then I will we can discuss as to how take care of this. Second is your answers are slightly longish. So you have to be precise. You have to end your answer somewhere. So when I when I told you that you want to pour. More and more information. I had this longish answers also. So when you know about the subject more than what is required, then you know you have a tendency to tell everything which is related to the question. 
you were not irrelevant you were to the point but as you go on and on the content content you know quality of content goes down naturally so there is there is a difference in answering a question and explaining the question explaining the answer so try to restrict yourself to giving the answer not to explain the answer so when you try to explain what you have said it becomes wrong आपने एक पॉइंट कहा उसके बाद बिकॉज बिकॉज सर इलेक्ट्रिफिकेशन में लॉन्गिशनेस ऑफ योर आंसर एंड सेकेंड अबाउट स्पीकिंग अबेट फास्ट दैट इज समथिंग आई थिंक विच यू हैव टू प्रैक्टिस प्रैक्टिस इट इज नॉट बिकॉज यू आर नॉट एलिजिबल आज तो हमारा ऑडियो प्रॉब्लम भी हुई है आई हैव रिक्वेस्टेड मिस्टर सुमेश कि इफ वी कैन हैव योर इंटरव्यू अगेन सो ही विल कांटेक्ट यू यू सेपरेटली बिकॉज़ यू आर वेरी ब्राइट एंड वी वांट अ वेरी गुड इंटरव्यू विद यू विदाउट एनी ऑडिशन प्रॉब्लम एंड आर आर इन फ्रेंड्स सो फार हैज बीन दैट योर ऑडियो प्रॉब्लम इज एट योर साइड सो so please check in the next time when whenever sumesh fixes your interview again but coming back to the point except for these two things you were almost perfect thank you sir right? and uh, i would say that you would uh, in case you perform an interview like this in the actual setup in psc you may certainly get around 65% marks and uh, since you are an iitian and you are uh, you know very bright you know your subject well so please expect lot of difficult questions you know as the interview proceeds there is a tendency for the board to ask you more and more difficult questions because you are able to answer them well. so usse ghabrana nahi hai aur achhi that is a good sign okay so keep your knowledge jo aapne abhi bana ke rakhi hai usko expand it rakhiye aur bas ye do cheez hoga thoda practice kar lijiye so i think uh, you would certainly touch 70 72% it will not be difficult for people like you and dress up well okay anything you would like to ask sir uh, ये एक क्वेश्चन जो मुझसे बहुत बार पूछा जाता है इसकी गवर्नमेंट ने तुम्हारी आईआईटी के एजुकेशन पे इतने लाखों रुपए खर्च किए उसके बाद तुम वो सब छोड़ के एक जनरलिस्ट सर्विस में आ रहे हो तुम टैक्स पेयर मनी इतना वेस्ट कर रहे हो तो इसका मुझे कोई सेटिस्फैक्ट्री रिस्पांस नहीं मिल पा मतलब मैं इसका क्या रिप्लाई दूं उसका देखिए खन्ना साहब आप शायद लाइन पे हैं तो खन्ना साहब से मैं गुजारिश करूंगा कि इसका आंसर आप बेहतर दे सकते हैं हां क्या क्या पूछ रहे हो सर एक्चुअली मुझसे इंटरव्यू में एक बार पहले भी पूछा जा चुका है कि तुम आईआईटी से हो तुम्हारे ऊपर गवर्नमेंट ने ऑलरेडी इतने लैक्स ऑफ रुपीस खर्च किए हैं तुम्हारी एजुकेशन पे और तुम वो सब छोड़ के जर्नलिस्ट सर्विस में आते हो तुम वो सब टैक्स पेस मनी वेस्ट कर रहे हो सो हाउ डू यू जस्टिफाई दैट तो उसका जस्टिफिकेशन एक ही है कि आप सर आर के ही एनवायरनमेंट में आ रहे हैं और जो सारा इन्वेस्टमेंट है और जब भी आप जॉब में आते हैं तो आप वो इन्वेस्टमेंट को रिटर्न करते हैं सूट समेत एंड दैट इज वेयर योर क्रेडिबिलिटी लाइज सो आई थिंक दे रिप्लाई टू दिस क्वेश्चन दैट गवर्नमेंट हैज स्पेंड मनी यस गवर्नमेंट हैज स्पेंड मनी बिकॉज़ टुडे यू आर बिकॉज़ ऑफ हेल्प फ्रॉम द गवर्नमेंट but number 2 is that you will also become a very reliable and trustworthy tool for the governance and all your knowledge and what you have acquired you will be giving it back to the society so i think this is uh, 
how it is it's a circle government has invested you you will return it back to the society to the government and for the government thank you sir so just to just to add uh, uh, abhishek to what kanna sir has mentioned you know just two things one bring out the virtues and good points of civil service okay it has it has larger reach right it is it is diversified more diversity you can influence with your good work a larger number of people and in terms of the satisfaction of contributing to the country in a larger magnitude is also there when you join civil service and regarding iit sir iit will certainly help me that is the base that i have developed it has given me an exposure and i have also become an expert in electrical engineering so as and when i'll use this knowledge in my day to day you know work in civil services and shall apply the tools and techniques which i have learned you know as a technocrat in various sectors wherever i am posted from time to time okay thank you sir anything else yes. nothing else sir. thank you so all the best abhishek thank you sir thank all you sir. the best abhishek all the best abhishek thank you sir